I was paralyzed from the waist down. My wife will send me a text message. I'm like, chat GBT, how do I reply to this? And that was like the really sexy stat in the beginning that gets people in the door. Well, Biggie said it best, man. Mo money, mo problems, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> Boom. Drop the yeah. mic, you know? <laughs> Welcome to the Million Dollar Sellers Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Chouquet. Today we have Jason on the call. I know he's been around for a while. I saw that you started your business in 1996, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, thanks for coming on, Jason. And uh, for those of uh, the listeners that don't know you, why don't you go ahead and just tell a little bit about yourself, what life's like at home, and uh, you know what you got going on business-wise as well. Um, sure. Yeah. 1996, uh, I guess you don't get gray hair for nothing, right? <laughs> like I've been doing this for, uh, doing this for a long time. We, uh, started out as retailers in Manhattan with a store called entertainment outlet, kind of like uh tower records was kind of okay. like what we used to do really started it like while I was in college, you know, like I used to literally rollerblade to another wholesaler and like put CDs in my bag <laughs> and put them on the shelf and like that kind of thing. Nice. And we grew that to three stores in Manhattan. And when you're in Manhattan, you usually are uh, powerful sellers. Volume-wise, you may not be making money, but you definitely sell a lot of stuff because you got to pay the rent. Yeah. So part of what we did was turn our retail business into a wholesale business as well. So we were you know, wholesaling out CDs to the rest of the country and stuff like that. And very early on, we realized that we had a ton of inventory and we actually started selling product on eBay and on Amazon. So way back in the early days. Nice. Pretty, pretty quickly, we realized that eBay was, you know, a big pain. And Amazon, you know, FBA was just so easy. So we just started really shifting all of our resources into that. And that really, we've been writing you know, software and building processes in our, you know, retail store, which eventually turned into a warehouse forever, it seems. Just, you know, how, you know, how to forecast, you know, are we profitable, how to pricing around, you know, all of those different pieces. It just feels like we've been doing this stuff um, forever. So that was sort of, uh, you know, how we got into the Amazon business. Nice, nice, man. And I know you got a lot of interesting things going on. You've got your, you know, your software that you're providing, which I think is a pretty unique one in the business. And I want to talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute as well. But like, how did you get into uh, this entrepreneur lifestyle, right? Like what, what was life like growing up for you in New York? And like, how did it lead to entrepreneurship? Yeah. So, so basically grew up in Brooklyn. Um, my dad owned, uh, like pharmacy type stores, like a Rite Aid type of a business where I would get on a bus with like a little bus with no air conditioning and leave from college and go to Union City, New Jersey from Manhattan in order to count toothpaste and socks and like women's underwear. <laughs> and I was just like, this is torture. I was like anything but this piece. And we got the opportunity where we got a phone call from my uncle who was like, I got a store. We want to kind of throw some stuff in there. It's, you know, I have used movies and music that we need someone to help us figure out like how to sell it. I was like, well, I'm in. It's not, you know, <laughs> toothpaste. It's not like, you know, it's something that's a little more exciting. I was like, just get me out of this, you know, this industry because it was really miserable. Um, and I really, you know, took that on just very early on. And I think I just had a, a love for music and movies, you know, in the beginning anyway. Nice. So I really just, you know, retained information, a little bit of a photographic memory. Okay. Like, hey, I just retained information just quickly and was really just very into dealing with people. And, you know, they would say, I like this artist. Yeah. And I would know what shelf it was on, even nice. though nothing was in alphabetical order. Like I was like, yep, saw that here. Yeah. So I really just, you know, was super into dealing with, you know, people and just love what I was doing. And then the, you know, I worked in a law firm at some point also for like, I think it was two weeks. Yeah. And by the end of the second week, I went into the like person who hired me and said like, all right, like I'm sending faxes. So I'm like handing faxes to people. I was like, I think I can do more, you know? So she said, you, uh, you know, like, all right, well, you'll get there, you know? 
So I didn't come to work the next day. Nice. So she called me and she's like, where are you? I was like, yeah, you said, I was like, when you get there, you know, call me and I'll do something else. She's like, that's not how this works. I was like, yeah, I'm not really cut out people. <laughs> like, I, <can't, laughs> like, I was like, I, I can't just run around with mindless stuff. I was like, I really yeah. just, I'm going to have to figure out how to do something for myself because this is not, you know, me being somebody else's employee just was not, I think really early on, I realized that that was not something that was going to work for me. Yeah. So my whole, my whole journey, you know, through business has really been a journey to try and figure out how to not work for someone else. Yeah. Like, let I me love just, it. <laughs> yeah, like, let me just figure that out. And like at all costs, you know, so we, we definitely had some, you know, scares along the way. Right. When we, you know, we're selling some music, it's like 2004, Tower yeah. Record goes bankrupt. You know, like the world is clearly like going to start to, you know, end. Like we, we were just definitely, you know, sweating, you know, as streaming became more popular and, you know, around 2012, 2013 started to get really ugly where like, you know, Amazon was no longer doing, you know, a lot. And it was just like, what are we going to do in order to, my brother used to be a business partner. He went off on his own to go do his own thing with somebody else. Uh, he ended up working for a company called, uh, RBX. And they opened a direct to consumer business. Um, as long he was really they were opening retail stores originally. And they as an afterthought were like, hey, we're trying to do our own website. He said, like, you should really be doing Amazon. And he told the, you know, ownership over there, you should probably call, you know, Jason and Lenny, who was, you know, he was part of our business. It's like just see, like what it is. So we flanked them, like, you can list, you can this, you can do all of these things. Like it's not that hard. They're like, we don't know what you're talking about. And they said, can you do it for us? We're nice. Like, do it for you? And they're like, yeah, like, we'll pay you to do this for us. We're like, okay, I think this might be a thing. So we actually started warehousing for them and we started really handling that whole, you know, game of yell and an agency sort of in the same motion. And then, you know, start to tell other people like, hey, we know how to do Amazon. And that really is, was, became us shifting from, you know, selling our own product to really becoming an agency and helping other people to sell their product on Amazon. So you guys are the original, my Amazon guy. Uh, uh yeah, except we're not <laughs> looking at, we, we were never in the, uh, never in the position where I had a thought to say, I want to have a thousand accounts. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I was like. Yeah, you know, if we can manage a couple accounts a year, we like we're we're fairly um, boutique. Yeah, you know, we we have like sixteen accounts that we manage. We try and manage, you know, bigger type accounts and just you know give it a full focus. And like if we can't really treat people and make them feel like they're the most important, you know, thing to our company, then we're doing something wrong. Nice. And I don't know, God bless people like my Amazon guy in these agencies that have a thousand customers or 500 accounts. It's just not something that I even, not something that I even dream of. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, we, part of our business was really the software that we had running in the background to support everything that we do. And my partner was always wanted to push selling software. And I was like, he's like, we sell software. And I was like, no, focus on what we do. You know, we know Amazon, we don't know software. And we basically put into place an automated pricing piece that was originally just inventory based that would raise prices. Basically what I would do manually. I would sit yeah. there and just raise prices all day when you're running low, overstock, and we just I would do all this stuff manually. And we basically just took the ideas that were in my head and automated that into a very pretty basic repricing tool early on. And when I saw that and what we were doing internally. I was like, okay, like you got me. I think yeah. can sell this. And this is not just a reporting tool, which I was always afraid to try and get into selling that. It was just like, everybody has reporting, you know what I mean? And like what, you know, I, I was probably a mistake in hindsight because yeah. we were much more ahead of the curve because we've been doing it for so long. But once we had this automated pricing, you know, piece, then we went into software and were able to you know, build out our AZ seller kit, which is basically just the forward facing piece of what we were doing internally forever. And that can scale, you know, to infinity yeah. without really needing to, you know, be super, super hands-on. So that became much more exciting 
actually like that, you can scale and, you know, just go on forever. Whereas the agency model, I really feel like the bigger you get, the worse you get in theory yeah. at service, unless you really are, you know, super, you know, talented, which some people are. I don't even have the, I'm just not, not even in my wheelhouse to try yeah. and be that big. I really prefer, you know, letting everybody know that, you know, we picked you <laughs> to be like one of our accounts. Yeah. And there's a reason for it. We're in this together and like you have our all. Yeah. That's really more of how we, you know, how we just, how I feel is the right way to treat people. You know? Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that, man. It's, uh, when you want, when you care about how you're interacting with people, like you want to maintain that kind of close relationship so things stay the same. And it's easy to lose that when you bring more people into the mix. Uh, I yep. definitely want to talk a little bit about AZ Seller Kit, but um, before we jump into that, man, like, is, is, so you're a music guy, right? Like, big into music, big into movies. What kind of music were yeah. you listening to back then, and and what are you listening to now? So it was actually kind of really. Uh, we we had a store in uh, the you know on 14th Street in Manhattan, which was a little bit of kind of like a Spanish hip hop type neighborhood. Nice. Okay. And when when I was you know, younger, you know, it was Pearl Jam, Nirvana, you know, those kind of you know days, Dave Matthews Band and whatnot, you know, like that was my thing. And then all of a sudden, the Notorious B.I.G. Yeah. came out with a double CD set that sold probably like we had a line of like 100 people outside the store wow to get this double cd set i i didn't really understand what this was or what you know i was like i gotta put this in and see what you know what is this that everybody wants to hear and when i put that in it's been a rap fan since yeah. then. like that that's it i am an east coast rap guy and like that whole like that one double cd set changed my whole viewpoint on music uh like how is it so now um, I, I can't uh it i feel bad when the windows are rolled down and i drive yeah. by people because uh you know i'm just like i really should not be blasting rap music here i get it and i know the image if i saw someone else that looked yeah. like me and i'm yeah. just like i'm gonna roll up the windows <laughs> and like heading to my house but it's like i promise i really do love this stuff you know? that is too funny man i'm like that with my kids right like i'll be in the van i'll have like three kids in the car and like we're all just jamming and just having a blast and yep. i've got this other car when i don't when i don't have the van i'll have like one or two of the kids with me it's got a good stereo system in it and i swear my kids are like they're like addicted to it my son my youngest son he'll like obsessed with the keys obsessed with the car always wants to go on a ride uh, it's so cool to have those moments with them. And then, yeah, I think about like someone looking at me, like, who's this guy with three kids in his car, like, you know, pumping some biggie music, like just getting <laughs> it in. It's like eight 15 in the morning. Right. And like, I'm yeah. at the stoplight, like, yeah, like kids are in the back just jamming with me. Uh, that's yep, super exactly. cool, it's man. Like, it's the clean version from Spotify. I swear yes. it's the clean version. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, man. Do you still listen to any of the, I listen to like everything. Um, hey. like, so do you still listen to some of that other, you know, ner like I'll still jam when a good Nirvana song comes on and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's actually, so my, my, I have two, I have three kids. I have a daughter who's 14, a son who's 12 and another son who's seven. So my, my 12 year old actually plays the drums and is like super into pop music and like Britney Spears and you know like Christina Aguilera and like it's just so odd that he's a drummer and like he'll play drums to that kind of stuff so we got very poppy in our house okay like he knows the top 100 songs on Spotify you could wake him up in the middle of the night and he knows like the order changes of the top 100 and stuff wow. like that and my seven-year-old is just like loves Nirvana cool he's like he's like smells like teen spirit like all day long He's like, I can, he'll headbang to that. And he just loves any type of, you know, rock also. Well, so it depends on which kid I have in the car and who gets, uh, you know, who gets priority for the music. But that's, uh, so we definitely, we travel both, you know, both worlds of rock and the uh, basic pop music in the car. Nice, man. I love those moments with the kids in the car, just jamming uh, the good times with them. Uh, super cool, man. I'm, I'm glad we got to know you a little bit on that level. Uh, I'll definitely make sure to bring, bring some good rap music whenever I plan on seeing you. 
Um, yeah, right. If you're in Barcelona, <laughs> I hear Biggie's big in Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. man. Right. I love it. Uh, well, talk to us a little bit about Amazon Seller Kit. I looked at it a while back. Um, I know you guys were a bit a bit ahead, like with I think you guys had like Google Sheet dashboards or something that you could you could get and- that had some pretty good metrics to monitor. I know you guys were kind of early to the pricing game. Like how? Yep. What are you? Are you guys doing? Anything crazy with pricing now, like from an AI perspective or or what? Um, so we are, you know, always, you know, I'll say growing and trying to innovate with the, you know, with the APIs that Amazon gives you. Mm-hmm. My partner, Lenny, is actually now at an Amazon conference for developers okay. and sitting with them. And they just, you know, they don't even tell you the APIs that they have. Like they make it so challenging and it's really... Um, it's so strange how little support that they have. And then like, he's telling me he's at the conference and the developers are talking to him and they're like, tell me what you want us to do and we'll do it. Like, it's like, it's such a small, like they seem so big when it, but when it comes to the APIs that they give you, like the search query performance, like he's meeting with the search query performance lady and she's like, yeah, if we, if I can convince my boss to let us do with APIs, then we will do it. Yeah. And he's like, how, what do you need to convince her? And so Lenny's told her like, maybe I'll get on the phone with you and I think I could convince her. She's like, that's an amazing idea. Yeah. And I was like, how ridiculous is that? Right. (laughs) That Amazon doesn't realize like some of the tools that they have and that, and that these things should be available through APIs. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the, you know, a lot of the pricing things that we do are very, for now are rule based and we're not. AI, uh, we, I don't believe in AI, at least in its current construct for this stuff, primarily because, and again, I could be, could be change this opinion over time as things grow. But when we were first playing with AI, it was our version, right, of AI of what we were experimenting with, which is not the, you know, $10 billion chat GPT AI, you know, like it's basically was fairly basic AI. And when you start to see the decisions, and and I see this with a lot of other tools as well, specifically in advertising, when you look at the PPC AI tools that are out there, we always ended up going away from them because you it ends up being a bit of a black box where they can't explain why things happen. You know what I mean? And the answer to the question is generally, you know, it raised the bids by $4 because AI thought it was going to be smart. And just like, uh, I don't, but that doesn't, but it's not. They're like, oh, but there's probably a data point. So it's like, uh, you know, like, oh, right. I can't, you get to a certain level of your business where if you're doing, you know, a couple million dollars a year, kind of know what you're doing. You know how you got there. Yeah. So to turn the keys over to AI and you see things that don't make sense, it's tough. So when we tried doing that with pricing, we really found that I couldn't explain 20% of the pricing decisions. I mean, so 80% are good, but if I can't explain 20% and I'm putting an item that is ranked, you know, on page one and is ranked number, you know, 11 in my category, I can't sleep at night if something is going to make a change that I don't know why it's making that change. So I'm still in this mode of, I have a hundred if then statements, you know what I mean? That are basically making pricing decisions, but I can look at any decision and understand why a decision is being made. And I can't sleep at night unless I can look at something and say, I know why we made that decision. Yeah. So that's where we are now. Like now as, you know, the the AI of the, you know, Microsofts and Googles of the world start to do, you know, analysis of spreadsheets and things like that. You know, right now it's still very limited. You know, they're giving you like 14 lines on a spreadsheet that you can do at a time, which is, you know, not going to help us for the, uh, you know, 500,000 SKUs that we're managing, you know, so like at, at a certain point, I'm sure that that analysis will be, you know, better. And for me as what I feel like, where I feel like it's going is when you have the ability to tell AI to look at these 20 data points and, you know, tell it what you want it to do to a certain extent, I feel like that'll really be, you know, the next iteration of when it gets better, when you can really, you know, talk to AI and 
limited scope so that you can still sort of understand what it's doing. So yeah, it's we're... interesting. Uh, like, I'm kind of similar, right? Like, I'm not scared of AI. Like, I don't think I can be replaced by AI. Like, and the way that I leverage AI is like helping me come to my own conclusion. It's like having a discussion with myself. Exactly. But, Just make my process faster. Yeah. yeah. But I but I still want it to be, it still needs to be, you know, my thoughts that, you know, the end results, you know, come out of the things that I want to have happen. Right. So, you know, I feel like there are, there is a world of which, and this is where like we are probably different than most, but like most sellers, and I feel like part of MDS, right? Most of us are already in that million dollar plus most of the Amazon sellers are well below that. Yeah. So if you're talking about like a, a community of people that you're selling to, if you're going to say I have, uh, you know, a PPC software or a pricing software or, you know, something that is AI heavy, a lot of the people in that lower tier, it's a huge market, right? Yeah. Like people that aren't confident, feel like they don't know what they're doing and would love for something to tell them this is the right answer. Yeah. So that's great for them. Like their kind of PPC strategy, they're not sure. So this software will, you know, give them answers to the questions that uh, they just were lost to begin with. So that's better than them, you know, themselves. When you get to certain level, which is what a lot of, you know, us in the group are, you have confidence in your decision making. Yeah. You know I mean? And you want to know that whatever, you know, software you're handing your tool over to or your business over to reflects the decisions that you want to make and so far we haven't been able to replicate that with ai but it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen yeah i mean at some point but well, that I is think I we're think training the way it now right <laughs> we're, no we're, exactly, we're training exactly. It. <laughs> but i think that the way that you said it really is so you know succinct where it's just like i want ai to just make the decisions that i would make yeah i mean i want it to be i still need it to be me you know and and I think it'll get there and I think we'll learn we'll learn eventually, you know, how to do that. We're just, you know, we're still it's so new, you know. Yeah. That we're still in our, you know, if then statement, control, understanding, conservative, and you know, just understanding every move that I used it the other day for um a uh, a business proposition I was given and I had to do, I was like, all right, if I have X amount of equity in the company and, you know, a share is worth this amount now, four years away, it's worth this. And like, how does that play out if it gets to $150 million in revenue? And like in my head, I was like, you know, I think I could put this math on a spreadsheet and create like a formula, but, but like, I'm going to so try chat easier. GPT. Yeah. And uh, I mm. did it for like 20 minutes and I, I gave, I showed my wife the output that I got to. And I was like, hey, if you just read this, do you understand what I was trying to figure out? And she did. And yeah. it was like six sentences, you know? That's great. That's great. <laughs> That's great. I, I, was, we, I was looking at some forecasting stuff and I, I had an idea that I, you know, I want to change. So I just asked ChatGPT, I was like, how can you do this? What formulas, you know, would you use in order to achieve this goal? It wrote out a set of formulas that, was basically Chinese to me. Yeah. I cut and pasted it. I sent it to my data scientist. I was like, you know what this means? Can you do this? He's like, yeah, I get it. I was like, oh, nice. I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I know I don't know what this means, but I have a feeling it's probably right. And it, I could probably spend three hours, you know, cutting and pasting those forms to figure out what's happening. But somebody else knows what this means. So, but at least I was able to express my idea and get yeah. the answer out in a format that, you know, that ultimately gets to be usable. That's super but cool that's, how we can use it to like fill a knowledge gap on our end, but we're also helping, you know, like you helped your data scientist and he may have not gotten like, he may have not gotten there on his own, right? I mean, like you, the, the ability for you and the AI and him to like collaborate is yes. insane. Uh, yes. No, it's, it's super so, cool. Yeah, it is. It is. It's so it's, you know, there's so many, I spend so much of the day just you know, instead of asking, you know, you know, Lenny, who's like our IT guy, you know, he kind of is the, you know, I would just say, what's the formula for this? How can I, can he do this? Can he do that? Just ask chat GPT as if they're the smartest person in the room. Yeah. And usually it's going to give you, you know, just an answer. Like, it's just, it's amazing how, how much you can get, you know, out of that. 
You know? I love having it on my phone. Do you have it on on your phone? Yeah, of course. App? Yeah, Dude, I like. I could. My wife will send me a text message. I'm like, Chat GBT, how do I reply to this? Like, what should I say? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it is. It's so convenient on the phone, man, that you can just use it uh, anywhere you want to. And and I'm excited to play around with that tool more and uh, yep. you know involve it in the business as well. Um, talk to us about Amazon Seller Kit, man, and and the problems so, that it solves and what makes you guys unique. Yeah, cool. So so we're we're very heavy on reporting, right? And we really believe in like Amazon has given so much more data over the last like year, you know, session data, unit session percentage, all of those things are real now. So we really specialize in accounts that have larger SKU counts and we do a really good job with um, you know, exports and spreadsheets like the dashboards are nice and pretty, but we give you the ability to customize the dashboards for yourself, save those views. And then, you know, export those views or have those views emailed out to members of the team, whether it's things that are, you know, low stock, you know, reports or, you know, high conversion rates, low conversion rates, sessions. But we're we're big believers in just looking at trends over time and trying to make decisions based on anomalies, right? Okay. Like when you have the larger your catalog is the more you're really looking to catch, you know, the trend that has changed. Yeah. So, you know, what we what we sell and kind of what the sexier part of what we sell is automated pricing, right? That gets people in the door. What invariably happens is we get someone in the door, like we have this cool tile on the top of the screen that we like added like four years ago that shows the additional revenue that, uh, you know, someone has made by using the tool. Nice. And it'll show hundreds of thousands of dollars, like for these sellers, because if an item was $20 and the software said it should be $22 because inventory was low or because the velocity was able to be supported and it does that. So it shows you that stat. And that was like the really, you know, sexy stat in the beginning that gets people in the door. And then over time, as people use it, it, you know, they'll say like, why do you not pitch this as a reporting tool? Yeah. And I was just like, because no one wants to hear about a reporting tool. But they're like, this reporting is so much more valuable, you know, than even the 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 pricing automation that's there. And I was just like, hey, we built this. We're running a business like this. We don't sell software. You know, what I mean, I'm an Amazon agency, you know, basically an Amazon seller. So we're continuing to add in the different things that we need as Amazon adds information. You know, a lot of the reporting is geared towards understanding price changes, right, and understanding when things change you know, what happens. And we, we just continue to grow with that, um, you know, that dashboard and those insights, you know, based on what we need. So it's, you know, it's constantly evolving and it's got everything from, you know, financials. It's basically like the greatest hits of all the softwares that basically yeah. we ever used in the past. <laughs> you know, nice. like we need a replenishment tool. Like I'm an agency. I can't pay for, you know, so stock 16 times. Yeah. So, we write our own version of a replenishment report. We have yeah. a, you know, a forecasting tool that's in there. We have a financials report that's like, a, you know, a seller legend or a seller, you know, seller board. So we have all of that is basically we needed to build that for ourselves over time. And, you know, we've got suppressed listing reports. We have buy box, you know, if you have problems with the buy box, like you have all of these things that you just need and we try and not have to have you log into Seller Central. Yeah. Like that's really what we're trying to avoid because Seller Central is, you know, cumbersome, a disaster, and like you don't, just don't want to be in there. Yeah. And it it's doesn't It's so have hard to find cost. certain stuff in there. I was in it's, the uh, Product Opportunity Explorer the other day. Lots of great stuff in there. Really hard to know that it's there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, who are you hiding this from? Right. Like, yeah. it, it, that's really the feeling is that, like, and, it really is. Seller Central is very much like shiny object show you sales, and they really don't show you, you know, expenses. They don't really show you, you know, storage fees that are going, you know, crazy. Yeah. You know, all all of this stuff they just don't make it easy to navigate and easy to see. So you know, the more SKUs you have, the more important it is to have, you know, tools that allow you to see things quickly. Yeah, it's and, crazy. Like the the things that become important as you scale. Like I'm really hard on my team about like shipment documents, right? Like the warehouse yeah. and the purchasing team. Like they just they're thinking of it from their perspective, and I'm like, yeah. no, something could happen like nine months from now, and if we don't have this piece of paper, we're screwed. 
Yeah, right? like, like we we, <laughs> ad, we added into the software like same thing. We we couldn't find the BOL all of a sudden. It's like one BOL. So now that's it. We changed the tool in a week. Now we have a place where you can save your BOL and attach it to every shipment. Nice. Like, that's finish. amazing. But like, but it happened. Why? Because you screwed up one time. Y- you know? Yeah. <laughs> like somebody couldn't find a paper once, and now you have a new SOP that says you know scan the document and attach it in the software and yeah. then it's there forever and that's it now you, you know you can sleep at night so there's there's a lot of you know things like that that are you know in the tool like Do you guys we have at, uh mm-hmm. go ahead go ahead sorry no i was gonna say like we were at prosper and the uh one of the largest accounts that we have on the software they're like the number eight seller on amazon you know so she walks up to the booth and like you immediately start sweating because it's like oh man like uh like, I hope she, you know, like, I hope she has good news that she's not going to yell at us, you know, like the highest paying customer that we have, you know, and like she walks in and she's like, we love your software because of this one thing that we do for advertising that shows us items that have a future date. So it's like, and we have an advertising report that shows you if your item is basically not available for sale now and you're spending money on it, you're basically tanking your item, right? Because you're driving traffic to Amazon. And it says available for sale in 10 days from now. Wow. Because Amazon started like six months ago. They started basically taking something that's built and is, you know, has the ship, you know, on it because they're doing ship to Amazon. Once it's noted as ship, they're like, okay, we know what it is. It's going to be available in a month. Yeah. It might go from a month to two weeks to seven days. But the minute it says available for sale in a month, you have the buy box. If you have the buy box and you had an ad campaign running in the background, it's going to start spending. So if you're spending money and it's not available, you're basically tanking the listing before it becomes live. So you're sending all, you're paying to tank your own listing. So, you know, she walks in and she's like, we all live on that report. It saved us who knows how much money. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. You can't really put a number on that, man. No. That's amazing. And like to us, that's like such a, it's like an inch of the software. Like it's something that's such a minor, minor piece. So like, you don't know what it is that, you know, but we built it for ourselves because it happens once. You're like, oh my God, look how much money I spent on this thing. We tank the listing. All right, what's the fix? Fix it, go next. And, you know, every, you know, sort of company has some of their own holes that they don't necessarily, um, you know, that you don't necessarily know what, we don't know ourselves what yeah. hole we're filling, but it's just everything that we can, you know, possibly, you know, put in there is is what we do. So. I think that speaks to the value of of the software, and I think it's it kind of you know supports your point. I guess not like the point, but you were talking earlier about how you didn't focus on the software, right? But you were focused on on Amazon, and now you have the software, and you're offering it to other people. But you have all this experience with you know things like that, and things like BOLs and uh, inventory, and how it affects pricing strategy, and and that's. Uh, someone who has a bunch of money to whip up a software mm. and sell it today, like you can't replicate that no matter, you know, unless they buy no. Jason out and bring him into the business, right? Like, and, that, and, you <laughs> know, and, and, and it's funny because that, you know, when all the money was crazy in, you know, 2021, where, you know, all the aggregators are buying stuff and ultimately there were, you know, offers to buy the tool, but it was also just offers to buy, you know, me and Lenny. Yeah. And I was yeah. just like that, I was like from 1996. All I know is I don't want to work for someone else. Yeah. I mean, and there's just (laughs) like, and I was like, I don't think there's an amount of money that I would want to actually spend the next two to five years with all of a sudden, you know, I'm 45 years old. All of a sudden, like now I'm going to have a boss. Right. I mean, like now I'm going to have to answer to people. Yeah. I was just like, you know what? I think I'm good. Like, Dude, uh, that's a you know, great way to look at it. Uh, that, because yeah, you like, didn't I, say just having, you were like how much I would actually spend over the next three to five years. Uh, oh, and, and in, in, in like sweat, you know what I mean? And in stress and in life and like, you know, like there's that, you know, the David Guyam, you know, mentality and like God bless him with all of his like, you know, you can manifest things. Like there's some people that want to, you know, want that billion dollar goal or a hundred million dollars, you know, like. I'm good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the, I, I, at this point in my life, I'm looking to trade, you know, money for stress, not stress for money. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I feel like if you, if you sell to one of these companies, you're basically taking money and you're increasing the stress in your life by 
tenfold, you know? So yeah, that, that, you know, and then you potentially lose that feel kind of lot, you know, you're, you're living it, you're the seller, it's yours. And now you're doing things that somebody else potentially wants to do or wants to direct it in a different way. You can't necessarily make the changes that you want. So like, um, you know, probably not the, you know, smartest guy for not selling when it was probably could have been, uh, you know, 20 X valuations, you know, but it's just not what, not what's important to me then. Yeah. It's not what's important to me now. You know, I just, you know, prefer to be my own boss at the end of the day. I'm always amazed uh, when when I hear people talk about a story like that and they just naturally have the ability to like stay true to themselves, right? Like I, it's um, like I struggled with that for a long time. I know a lot of other people struggle with that and like you're just, you know, you're able to reflect on that time, you know, way back when, when you were working for the lawyer and, <laughs> you know, you, you've maintained that uh, ability to stay true to, to yourself, which I think is unique. Uh, and, and great. Um, yeah, no, so that's was, super cool. That one of the other, one of the guys in MDS that I, whatever, I won't mention his name, but he, he actually were on the phone last week and there was some mistake that was made or whatever, you know, and he's like, Hey, you know what? Now that mistake just cost me, you know, probably, you know, a couple thousand dollars of which if I had it, I probably wouldn't know what to do with it anyway. So yeah. I'm not going to stress about it. You know, it's all good. And like, I'm sure everything's fine, you know, but yeah. like that, that mindset is just so much healthier, right? It's yeah. like you get you get to a certain amount of, you know, stuff that you have in your life. You know what I mean? You have like, is it is it worth making yourself crazy? I mean, because you've lost, a, you know, a zero or a thousand or ten thousand dollars or whatever it is, you know, because of something or stress to get to that next, you know, level. If it's, you know, if it's something that's going to stress you out, then you're just better off you know, just trade. That's, that's, that's my mantra. When yeah. you have the opportunity to trade money for stress, yeah. you know, if you can afford to do it, like that's why you went out and made the money. Right? Yeah. You made the money so that you could, you know, live a happier, healthier life ultimately. Well, Biggie and, said it best, man. Mo money, mo problems, money. right? <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> Boom. Drop the yeah. mic, you know? <laughs> he knew what he was talking about, man. Yep. Um, I, I was wondering on your, in uh, the tool, do you guys have any like, uh, convenient purchasing features. Like if I need to reorder product and now I've got to order from the supplier, do you guys kind of have like a pseudo CRM type thing built into it that helps me with that? So we have a replenishment tool built in there, which basically has, you can update your product catalog and like put your vendors in there for your items. And you can design your report to basically be in the format of the purchase order that you would nice. send to the vendor and kind of save that view. Um, and then you could basically just export those sheets with, you know, their vendor SKUs, you know, their costs. So there's like basically a million custom columns that you could add in. And it's just a matter of building it one time. You know, and once you set it up in that format, then it's just, you know, fill in your numbers, cut and paste and send off to the multiple vendors that you have. You know? Very cool. Nice. Yeah. That's super yeah. convenient. That's, um, yeah, it seems like you have a lot of features that are just good for scale, right? Uh, exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Those things that like you, you go for, like, I remember being in the business and it's like, man, I want to, I feel like I want to automate this, but I also feel kind of like shitty about thinking I need to automate it because I should just do it. Right. And be done with it. But like, as you grow, that stuff becomes <laughs> super convenient. So, so I'll tell you the, uh, the, the real origin story, which I, I generally don't talk about too much, but like the real origin story of the software is the, I was not, I was that I was not a believer in automation. I was like, I got it in my head. It's not worth the time. I can just do it. And like, we should be focused on making money, not on saving time. That was my philosophy and my brother and my partner, Lenny were, you know, just always like, let's try and automate. In 2008, I was in Hawaii surfing with my wife and I, I had this thing that's called surfer's myelopathy okay. where I was paralyzed from the waist down. And they had basically told me when I rolled into the emergency room that I was going to be paralyzed for the rest of my life. Holy crap. So, so the, you know, through luck, miracle, physical therapy, I was, I recovered, was able to, with a year of physical therapy, get back to walking, running, playing sports, like against all odds. And as part of that process, while I was going through this ordeal in the hospital and through physical therapy, 
Lenny and Adam had to do my job. So I just couldn't work necessarily. So they were just saying like, you got to get these ideas out of your head because we can't do your job and our jobs, right? Unless we automate it. So like you have to like break down and you got to tell us what you're doing so we can automate it so we can function. And then I broke down. I was like, okay, let's see what I'm doing. Let's take the ideas. How am I replenishing? How am I changing pricing? How am I for like, what are, what are all these inventory management things that I'm doing manually and how can we automate it so that they can actually do it while I was out? And that really was. And then once I started to see that and I was like, oh, wow. So I just saved six hours. Yeah. You know, and it was basically 90% as good as me. But with that 10%, I'll tweak a few things. And that was really when I, my mind started to open and be much more, um, you know, just let's automate and not let me just do it because yeah. I can probably do it better. That was like a big turning point in sort of our business evolution it really helped us to scale oh, man that's awesome i mean first off that you just you know you made it through that like that's that's a hell of a journey right there but for that <laughs> yeah. to come out of that um that that's pretty amazing i've i've also been surfing all my life and never heard of this and now i'm a little freaked out <laughs> uh it, it generally only happens to first time surfers Okay. Uh, it basically happens from doing this like upward dog position. They say that ah, if you're on the board. Yeah. And so they say that first time surfers generally tend to stay in that position for longer than they should kind of waiting for a wave. And then when you go and pop up, there's something that happens that they don't really understand that said like the MRI makes it look like you've been in a car accident. Wow. Like it looks like something traumatic happened. Like it looked like Dennis Bird. I don't know if you remember that Jets guy who was basically like paralyzed. It said like yeah. it's the same MRI pattern of that guy who got like hit in the, in the head and basically was paralyzed. That's what it looks like. Wow. It's not traumatic, but it is very specific to first time surfers. So if you're, if you're at number two, yeah. you're good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you got nothing to worry about there. And uh, yeah, but it's, and it seems to be, you know, 90% of them happen in Hawaii for a reason that no one really can explain. It was on this like ABC medical mystery show, okay. which was like two months before I went, that show, you know, was aired and I didn't see it, but some other people had. And yeah. it was basically like this surfers myelopathy thing. And the next thing was a guy who basically is a human tree and has like blisters that form a tree. And he looks like a, you know, like a, literally like a, horror movie character wow. and like that's how freaky the like i was like wow it was a me and tree guy <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're in the same uh but uh but yeah no nah, it's very infrequent and like there's really nothing to be you know nothing to be worried about if yeah. you're a surfer <laughs> all right good to know <laughs> yep. yep well jason i saw on your uh on some of the information you gave us that you, you you've got a pretty big team and and you seem to be uh you know pretty good at team management and before we wrap up like if you could just kind of drop some uh some you know critical things you've learned because i think that's mm. one of those areas where like i've complicated it uh it, but it, i think it can be more simple and and i also mm. saw on your notes that you mentioned you know you were really good at breaking down complex problems into to simple things so i think it would be good mm. if the audience could you know get your opinion on that yeah so we've got about 25 people working for us remotely you know not including we have a warehouse that has like another 20 people but that's sort of that's a very different you yeah. know style managing you know minimum wage type employees you know and managing you know, remote workers, but really what we found over time and like some people think that like we're nuts, but it really, it works for us is we, you know, we try and find people that, you know, think like ourselves that are just, you know, mellow, same mindset, just nice, normal people like that are, you know, it makes a difference from the outset. You can sort of feel a vibe. Yeah. And we tell them very early on that like you have to log on to the computers in the office and we're, we have your computer on, like when you punch in, you can punch in and punch out whenever you want. Like, all I ask is that if you say you're working, you're working. If you want to punch out, no schedule. Anytime you want, you have to make a meeting, obviously do whatever you want, whenever you want. But if you're punched in, we use a software called time station, then I expect you to be working. And I want you to know that I have your computer on in the background and I'm going to be looking at what you're doing so that if you're doing something that is maybe not a priority or something that I see is doing wrong that you, you know, you could improve on, we're watching. And when people 
from the get go tell you like, oh, that's crazy, then you're not for us. Yeah. Right? Like you have to be comfortable that if you're working, that someone can be in the way I explained them, I was like, the world used to function in an office where, you know, the boss or the manager could walk around and just kind of say hello and see what's flying. And like we try to create that sort of environment, you know, remotely where everybody kind of knows that at any point we could be, you know, kind of watching what they're doing and giving them feedback. And we only give positive feedback, right? Like I'll never say anything negative to anybody. You know, it's always just kind of to let them know that we're looking like, ah, oh, this is, the, that's a good idea. You should probably tell this other guy on the team to do it the way that you're doing it. That's like nice nice thought process there but then you sort of you're just letting them know that you're aware of what they're doing and that has you know and if you can give people positive you know feedback on the work that they're doing the messaging is there that if they're doing if they're not working they're doing something stupid that you're also going to see that too yeah so you almost don't have to be a policeman you know what i mean like because that nobody likes that no one wants to you know what are you working on? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Like, that's not really the point, you know? The point is really to, like, I was always like, in, in retail, you wanted a big security camera, right? That's it. I don't want to catch someone stealing. <laughs> I mean, I just want to know, I want them to know that this is not a place, you know, like, you get the security guards. You get, like, just don't steal. You can make people dishonest if you give them too much flexibility, too much latitude. So, you know, put it, put the systems in place so that they're, you know, they're incentivized, not from a monetary standpoint, but just from an emotional standpoint yeah. where they know that, you know, potentially someone could be looking at what I'm doing and I should be working, you know, and that complemented with the flexibility of do whatever you want, whenever you want, you know, really has been, you know, a balance that has, I'll say worked more often than not. And probably the best thing is that when somebody is not good, you really see it quickly. Yeah. Right? Like you hire a guy just not on his computer. And then you kind of see what he's doing. There's like nothing, just screens moving and it just doesn't make any sense. Call him up. What's the thought process here? And then doesn't really make too much sense. It's like, okay, like the interview is great, but clearly whatever, you know, I got this one wrong because this guy is not, but you see it really, really quickly. And, you know, it's really been something that has led us. I feel like there's a certain personality type that is confident enough and comfortable enough in their own skin to feel like somebody's watching, but I know what I'm doing. So if somebody's watching, that's good. And it sort of weeds out the people in that interview process that has really landed us with really just confident, good people. So damn, that is really simple. (laughs) <laughs> it is really simple, right? No, it is, right? And like, and there's some posts it of like effective. hub staff and, you know, this thing and I have things on the software and it's taking keystrokes or whatever it is, like, and then they're faking out the keystroke thing. Yeah. It's like, you know, like, uh, you know, like I'm watching and I'm here to help and that's really it. Like, it's not yeah. so complicated, you know? I like where you landed. I kind of, I started on the you know, the time doctor and years ago, like I'm going to track everything. I'm going to audit these guys. Um, and, and then I got, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go performance based. Like, I'm not going to check time. I don't even care if they check in, but I like where you landed, you know, in the middle, like, Hey, you know, like in a retail store, you know, you would, or in in an office, I would see what you're doing. Yeah. And yeah, um, and yeah. And it is very retail or like I was just, I grew up with, everyone was working and when they punch clock and they needed to go to the store, they went to the store, but they punched their card and they left and it was fine. You knew they were gone. And when they punch back in, it's also fine. You know what yeah. I mean? Like just this, the idea that you can be sort of on the clock and doing nothing is something that to my core still bothers me from that, you know, retail mindset yeah. of that, you know, um, in theory, again, there are people that are salaried and that's sort of a different, you know, I don't even think there's any, no, no one is actually salaried in the office other than like okay. the warehouse manager. But like, that's it. Like if you're working and like people work 50, 60 hours a week and they get paid overtime and they yeah. should. Yeah. Like if you're putting in 60 hours a week and that's what the company needed, then you should get paid overtime. Like yeah. there's no, you know, like I hate that, you know, people that we interview sometimes and they're like, we get a base salary of X and I'm like, how many hours are you working? Like, I don't know, 55 hours a week. I was like, 
you're actually making like eighteen dollars an hour. You know what I mean? Like you you don't realize like how many hours you're putting in. Yeah. And like you if you actually worked, you know, and you want to get paid overtime and do whatever, either work forty hours and get paid less or work fifty five and get paid for the fact that you're, you know, putting in that blood, sweat and tears. That's one thing I've noticed, I've learned over the years is, and if we take like the off in office example and the virtual example, I was giving people way too many tasks and they were just saying yes. And (laughs) I could never see the impact I'm having on them emotionally, right? Because you're not picking up on that vibe in the office. You're not looking them in the eyes. Uh Um, Uh And I really had to check myself and, and- like dial it back and and start kind of tracking for my own purposes yeah. that what I'm giving other people and then I'm not overwhelming them. And now I've kind of swung the other way where I'm like, do a little bit less, like stop trying to yeah. do so much. Like let's yeah. do these three things really freaking mm-hmm. good. And then we'll move on to this stuff. Yeah. Um, no, and, and that's really where that, like that time station software also where you're telling them to punch in and punch out. And we've made that mistake also in the past where like you sort of overload someone thinking that, you know, it's not so tough. And all of a sudden you see they put in 50 hours that week. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, it's like, yo, like, you know, again, forget the fact that it's overtime you can work. We'll pay you overtime. It's fine. But what went wrong? Yeah. I mean, like what? And then they explain. But like, that's your that's your signal that you just drop too much on someone's plate. If all of a sudden they had to put in 50 hours and, you know, you, you find out really quickly. I mean, that they were you know, probably doing something that, you know, not too many people want to work 50 hours a week. So if they did it, then, you know, it's probably that we did something wrong. You know, yeah. if they ended up having to put those hours in. Nice, man. Well, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's a great piece of information that I certainly haven't really heard before, but it just, it just makes sense, man. And I've always been a fan of like, from a marketing perspective, like putting myself out there, putting you know, putting that out there and letting it reject and repel the people that it's not for. Yes, right? exactly. Like that's always my first fill. It's not to attract the people I want. It's like, mm-hmm. how do I get these people I don't want out of here? Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and then let me talk to the people that I do want. Um, and yeah. that's worked pretty well for me in, mm-hmm. in a lot of different ways. Yep. Um, the human strainer, right? Just sort of yeah. Shaking it and uh, <laughs> whoever's left to keep working yeah. with. Yeah. Well, well, Jason, man, thanks for coming on and and sharing your story and and a little bit about what works for you and your in your software. I think it has a lot of value. I'm certainly going to give it another visit again and see if it makes sense uh, for us now. It was a couple years ago when I took a mm-hmm. look at it. Yeah, it's um, very different now. Also, yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. thanks, man. And and for yeah. for anyone who wants to reach out to you and learn more about the software, where can they find you? Um, you can go to azsellerkit.com. There's a contact us button. Most of it goes to me and, uh, you know, another couple of members of the team that are on there. Solid. So, All mm-hmm. right, man. Well, thanks cool. again. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. All right. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it.